Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Glad you could join me. Winter's still hanging on around here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm pretty much done with it. Doing my best. Maybe you are too. Maybe you're enjoying a spring. But anyway, you'll enjoy this podcast today because we've got a lot going on. We're going back to the floor of Pheasant Fest where I cornered the whole Carter family. No, not the country music <laughs> Carters. The versatile dog training Carters. Blaine, Patty, Jason, and Missy will be joining me to talk all things dog training. And believe me, you are in for a treat. From uh, altering your current perceptions about how dogs think to tricks and tips that you might not have thought of in the world of dog training for your own dog or maybe you're helping somebody else i hope you are but that's not all uh, we'll hit the road uh, i'll offer up a tip from my webinar on strategically planning your day afield yeah make some sense you'll get it once we start talking about it and then We'll talk about uh, whether you would pay to play on a road trip. Yeah, something uh, that used to get a lot of people's hackles up. Uh, I'll take a look at the survey we did and, and share some thoughts on all of that. So it's all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast, made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, True Lock Choke Tubes, MidwayUSA.com, Joy Dog Food, and FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. Well, despite the recurring snow, <laughs> Flick and I are still working on uh, steadiness again. I guess I'll call it reworking, and he seems to be making progress. You know, one of the things that I've observed, and, and I think you'll hear this and when we talk to the Carter family later in the show, but uh, the more positive, um, not just positive encouragement you can provide a dog, but the more positive experiences the dog has during training, I think the more willing he is to be more compliant. I don't know how to phrase it otherwise, but it's working with us on live birds in, in a couple different ways. First off, we're back to... Uh, uh, training pigeons on the ground right in front of him so he is rock solid even though that bird is just walking around looking at him you know just like a covey of uh, chuckers would on a hillside in southeast oregon for example flick are you paying attention so um some things in that regard that I think are really important. Uh, we're pulling it off and it, it seems to be working. He's nice and steady on those. And of course, he gets a retrieve with a, a dead frozen bird or a dead thawed out bird afterwards. And that's where the positive reinforcement comes in. But what we're doing now is we're going a little, literally a little bit farther afield, putting those birds out a little farther from where he started working on that, the driveway, the backyard, the front yard. Now we're out in the field a little bit farther and the bonus is once in a while oh once in a long while uh there's some wild quail out there so we get some real world experience uh what about you what are you doing what are you working on with your dog share it at the social media pages and uh, and then at the newsletter the upland nation insights newsletter where i asked this question recently and and maybe because the season's over and we're starting to think about next year was a maybe a good time to ask this i said would you pay 50 bucks to a farmer for a high quality day hunt in good pheasant country and you know why I'm thinking about those sort of things. So many of us uh, go all the way to a place like South Dakota or Montana. And, uh, you know, the likelihood of finding good habitat that's publicly accessible, uh, let alone finding birds on that habitat, man, it's getting skinnier and skinnier. So the answer to the question, just to uh, put a fine point on it, is 79% of you said, heck yes, I'd pay 50 bucks. 
Um, another 12% said maybe, and uh, only about 8.5% said uh, no, never. And I got to tell you, that's that's a marked change from the debate on uh, social media three, five, ten years ago, where there were a lot of dyed in the wool public uh, hunting ground advocates who considered anybody who paid for hunting uh, to be a pariah. I don't know where you fall out individually on that, but I find it interesting that uh, uh, most of you would uh, pay or consider paying a little bit to somebody to do it. And, of course, that is kind of one of the variations on the walk-in hunting scenario. We pay. Yes, we do in one way or another, whether it's a two-buck surcharge on your license or a, a different permit or a tag or whatever it is, we do pay there. But some people will pay more than that. And hey, more power to them. Uh, maybe it's just the COVID thing and we're desperate for great hunting. Uh, yeah, maybe we finally figured out that the only people who can manage uh, great wildlife habitat or people who have a little bit more of an incentive than uh, a full-time job you can't get fired from and a pension that will be there uh, after 30 years on the job. Hard to say. Probably all those t t things and a few others like your travel time, fewer birds on the ground as I talked about. So, uh, you know, food for thought if nothing else. We are brought to you in part by Joy Dog Food. Joydogfood.com is where you learn more about their performance formulations, and they have several depending on what you're looking for in your dog. Now, this company may be new to you. It wasn't new to me. I remember them way back in the day when I was introducing Happy Jack dog care products to the bird dog market because they were in the same world, the hound dog world. They know a little bit about dog performance, and uh, they know how to get it through diet. That's why their uh, ingredients and their manufacturing process are all American. Fixed formulas, so there's no variation from bag to bag in what's in there and why it's in there. And they're available at feed stores throughout the United States. You can learn more about all you need to know at joydogfood.com and learn all you need to know about the gear you're stocking up on for next season at midwayusa.com watch some of the exclusive videos and articles that I have put up there thanks to midwayusa.com most recently uh, I talked about the essential training tools everybody needs yeah Take a look at that and then <laughs> shop for them at MidwayUSA.com. They carry just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors. Just ordered some socks and some camping gear for next season, all at MidwayUSA.com. Everything from dummy launchers to brush pants, boots to uh, electronic collars. It's all there at extremely competitive pricing. Yeah, 20,000 of those products will ship free. It works. MidwayUSA.com. Take a look. I'll see you there. Yeah, we got the whole fam family with us today. These are people you know from Wing Shooting USA. We've we've done some television episodes with many of them, not with you though, uh, and had a great time. Uh, the whole Carter family is here. In fact, uh, Patty, why don't you introduce everybody? Okay. Well, I'm Patty Carter from Merriman and Kennels and uh, the Carter family. Mother, my son Jason, my husband Blaine. And my daughter, Missy. And Scott, this was their Christmas present, a trip to Pheasant Fest. Oh, I love it. Well, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Glad you made it. Thank and you. I can't believe, you know, you've been to one before, right? What's that? You've been to Pheasant Fest before? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Well, we're going to do this. Wait, I just realized, everybody, being a music major, you'd think I could count to four, but I can't. 
I counted to three instead. So we're going to be swapping out microphones back and forth. So bear with us a little bit. But but the Merry Meeting Kennels uh, thing is probably the best way to start this all out. You folks are very active in the training world, even some breeding, very active in NABDA, which is where we all got to know each other. We had some great fun in, in the deep south on a couple quail hunts over the years. I'm still using some of those pictures. Those have been some of the highlights of my television career. But we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about dogs, training, all the things that are important to the folks who listen to this podcast. Blaine, you have some headphones and a microphone on now. Let's just jump right in. Tell us a little bit about the operation and what you guys are uh, doing mainly now. You mean at, at Mary Meeting? At Mary Canada. Meeting. <clears throat> well, uh, Jason pretty much has taken over uh, the training for most of it, all of it, actually. Uh, Patty and I have pulled back a little bit, and Jason is now taking in dogs for training and uh, helps me uh, every week with the group classes. Uh, we've, we're more geared, with, Jason does one-on-ones with the dogs, but uh, we're, we're ge- geared really predominantly at teaching people uh, to produce something out of their own animals. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's funny because there are, you know, I was a teacher to begin with as well, and and there's a real joy and a special feeling in teaching other people to teach as well. Do you get that? Oh, it, it, it's, it's tremendous. Yeah. I mean, to see um, people that are naive in, in, in their inability even to uh, uh, read the dogs. Yeah. And then give them, start giving them uh, the opportunity to put that to, the reading of the dogs to, into their training, and then watch that training develop itself. It's, it's, it is rewarding. It's here. Um, uh, Patty, he used a term twice now that I I really am big on, and that's reading a dog. You mm-hmm. know, I wrote a book called What the Dogs Taught Me because right. I I was looking at them all the time trying to learn stuff. Right. Um, Describe how we read a dog. Okay. <clears throat> so Blaine is being very humble with he, <laughs> in his introduction because, you know, we are a family and we do a lot together. And he, he, he does a lot of training. He has taught us all because he can read a dog so well, Blaine. And so we've watched and learned. And I, I love it when I hear verbiage that he has said over 20, 30, 40 years coming out of my son's mouth and out of my daughter's mouth. So, and it's, it's cool. I mean, Missy has is, is educated herself so well on all the intricacies of, of dog breeding, dog raising, health and fitness. And, you know, she adds so much to that part of it. So we are a team. Yeah. So it yeah. it's really works well, Scott. Well, so. I, you know, I know that you two, you and Blaine are great trainers of people, too. But exactly. some, some of it was in the DNA, no doubt oh, about that. For sure. Um, tell me, uh, Jason, what is the most important thing that you've learned from these two over the years about helping us train our dogs better? One of the, one of the things that um, we're getting a lot of questions about, which is yeah. different in um, some of the training from earlier on, is um, how do you train your dog was was in the past. Everybody wanted, okay, A to B to C. So nowadays is why are the dogs, why are you training this way? We're getting a lot of the why questions now, which is very interesting because that goes deeper into like what you're talking about. We're reading dogs. Yeah. And so growing up, you know, they called my father, like he, he was a dog, you know, he, he, he could, he intuitively look at a dog and know what it needed where all of us are going, okay, why, why, why are you doing what you're doing? It doesn't make sense to us, you know? And so, over over how many years now are we? We're 40 years of training. Well, the sign says 1976. 1976 is when they started. So um, many years of development, you know, and in, in, in we work together. Missy is one of the best trainers in our group when it comes to early developmental puppies. She understands that shaping and behavior and that how to get how to modify behavior using um, reinforcers is she's, she's a, incredible with it so that's fascinating so we all pick up from each other you know originally you were a no no treat guy you know I, you do you do this because I told you to and then <laughs> and then here comes mom with treats 
And she's jumping ahead in his, her training and just flying right along. And he's going, okay, hold on. What's going on here? I love and, it. Yeah. Yeah. That, so there are still family feuds once in a while, or although maybe you've resolved most of those. Well, you just used a word that I'm intrigued by. And, Missy, you're the person to, to address that. Uh, and that is this whole idea of shaping behavior in young dogs. Um, I tell everybody that a dog is learning from the day it comes out of the mother's womb. And we better start teaching, or they're going to learn something we don't want them to learn. But that's as far as I would go. You want to give us a little bit more guidance in that world? Keep us between the white lines? Sure, sure. Well, you know, many other trainers will say the same thing, is that you actually start your training the day you go to the breeder and pick that puppy up. And it's, you know, if you start to think of it that way, you really are. You're shaping that behavior. Um, when I bring a puppy home or I start training a puppy, I start in my kitchen every morning, first thing in the morning with their food. And I start creating the behavior that I want to see in the dog. And that food just allows me to lengthen and, and take advantage of their hunger to shape and get the behavior I want. But I make the picture smaller. And you'll hear Jason and Blaine talk about that a lot is when you start training, you want to make that picture small and you want to create that situation that is a positive you know result for you and the pup and to end on that positive note we so, can't end on that you got to tell me how you make the picture small i start in my kitchen i in every morning for example i will have a handful of food i will have the puppy sitting right in front of me and i'll have my feet against the kitchen cabinet so the dog has nowhere to go but me and i will sit teach sit i will teach come i will see whoa i'll stay um work on all different types of behaviors what, around their food yeah their food comes from my hand yeah so it never comes from a dish and so they really are reliant on you and you get their undivided attention yeah you know you bring that up and i've in previous podcasts i've talked about impulse control Mm. Absolutely. And that's what you're doing right there. And, and, and you're doing it on a micro basis. Mm -hmm. Now, at some point, with as many dogs as y'all feed, you do put food in bowls, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Or else it would be an all-day affair. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but they learn to respect those other dogs eating out of their dish when you are feeding your new pup, right? And yeah. you're teaching impulse control. You don't get to have their food. This is your food. It comes from my hand. Yeah. And until they're able to do that yeah. at an older age. Yeah. Well, let's let's riff on that a minute, Blaine. Um, when we talk about sh shaping behavior in a, in a slightly older dog, you know, in a, you know, six to twelve month old dog, do, we obviously do things different, uh, almost because it's a physical, a more physical process. But what are we? What are we? bad trainers not doing that we should do more of in that in that kind of age range i don't think you reached into what she was saying one of the neat things i just want to add before we jump way ahead yeah she's feeding by hand yeah if i wanted to teach a dog bite inhibitors yeah and shape that okay so in some cases with older dogs overly exuberant dogs that are very mouthy yeah, we got a corgi like that. <laughs> I like using my hand because now yeah. I, you want the food, you work for the food. And the food is, you can't hurt me to work for that food. You can't, you can't over, over grab me. You can't, you can't have overly possessive attitudes towards it. If you want to eat, you need to, be, you need to do it quietly and comfortably. Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm shaping some stuff shaping uh, uh, his delivery for hard mouth, for, for some of those things that are going to come later. I, I now have, even even how we, they go, ow, yeah. or, or, or yeah. stop it, right? Well, you have just, it, just with what she's talking about on the food, have started that inhibita those inhibitors that will help you in, in, in solidifying not to be hard mouth, not to be aggressive with the game, that kind of stuff. Okay, Brett, if you're listening, there's the best <laughs> explanation for that situation you had a while back i'm glad it's cleared up but if you ever have it again remember what blaine just said 
this is a story from not too long ago when I got this email, and it was frantic, and it was about a dog that had become, uh, you have a term for it, I'm sure, he was guarding his food and getting aggressive about anybody who would uh, even look at the bowl. You can nip that in the bud early on with with a Missy's shaping behavior. You're continu- your your two oh one level of the same thing. Those things really matter early on. Um, Patty, how about as an older dog? What are, what are some of the things that the I know I focus on mistakes because we all know the right way to do it, and then we do it another way. But when you're dealing with a class or an individual a bird dog trainer, uh, a hunter. What are, what are the most common uh, questions they have and problems you need to help them solve? Retrieving. You know, very uh, immature retrieving. They haven't got, <laughs> <clears throat> they haven't got the, the professionalism in the dog yet. The dog isn't paying attention. We, you, you sound like you're talking about a human being. <laughs> it is. It, well, I mean, we have to think of uh, what we want for that dog to do. Yeah. And, yeah. and we have to break it down. And I always yeah. tell people if they have, if I see a mistake they've made, yeah. the dog isn't making a mistake. The dog yeah. is only functioning on what they've been taught. Yeah. So um, I said, okay, break it up. You know, go back to having your dog stay on the place board. Yeah. And then you leave your dog and call yeah. your dog. Get that part correct. Then go back and put a bumper in the dog's mouth. So muscle memory will get that dog to you in the same way it did without the bumper. Yeah. So break it up, and that, you know, it works. But I don't think people think outside the box. Okay, keep going, because this is, okay. the, this is the other email and phone call I get very often. We got those two steps. Yep, yep. And the dog's coming to us. Yep. Okay. I want that dog, number one, okay. to be soft mouth, and I want that dog to give it up when I yep. ask yep. to give it up. Mm-hmm. So take me to that level. Okay. So you have to decide as a handler how you want the delivery. Yeah. So that that, staple, that part, first part was come to me and sit beside me. So yeah. I have to decide whether I put a place board in front of me uh-huh. or I stand beside the place board. So delivery either to my side or to my front. Yeah. So that in place, then you work on manners. And the food is magic. Because you've taught the dog, your hands goes to your chest, and you look down, and this food. The dog is going to look into your eyes. I, I, no, I, I live this every day. <laughs> I got a five-year-old wire hair. You haven't met him yet, but uh, that's exactly, just by sheer mistake yeah. did I realize yeah. that that is what a really helpful uh, attention-getting device. Yeah. And then do we offer that food as the uh-huh. release? Yeah, as, it, as you develop the okay. trait, you offer it yeah. quite often. And then yeah. you start holding back a little bit. There or you go. the dog's performance will come up because yeah. he's trying to figure out how to get the food. Yeah. yeah so, so I'm doing this. Uh, you can't see any of this, but I'm going to describe it. So what I've gotten to from here is yep. food in my hands mm-hmm. in front of my chest. He's looking at me. I take the empty hand and go up like this. He follows that hand. And I can take, I can order the release. Okay. And he's more than willing to give it up because he knows eventually that means we're doing this. It's a deviation of what I do, but yeah. I don't do the hot, you know, the flagged hand. Well, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, because you have short but hairs most of the thing, time. Another thing, Scott. <laughs> another thing. Another thing, Scott. I do early on is teach eye contact. Yeah. So yeah. on the training table, yeah. just look at my eyes. Yeah. You know, and that look at my eyes. Yeah. And then you transfer that to the ground, look at my eyes. So. So yeah. how do uh, how do you do that, Jason? You're about ready to tell me how to do yeah. that. So. Without food, or maybe yeah, that yeah. is the trick. It is. With, you tell us how you get a dog to make eye contact when you're not doing, say, a retrieving drill. Right. So um, we, we focus drills are what you're talking about. Okay. So we'll do a we'll we'll do a uh, we use place boards. We'll have the dog sitting on the place board, and we'll get the dog's attention with a treat close to our face, and we get we put a command to it. Whatever we use, watch, and uh, the dog makes eye contact. The second it makes that eye contact, you, you in something that's worth talking about is verbal markers. Yeah. So, so you don't really necessarily have to have a treat. Young pups, you do. Yeah. Because their attention span is so short. But yeah. as they get older, we put marker commands to it. Uh, yes, good dog. Yeah. And, and so then we can reach into our pockets. Sometimes the treat becomes a distraction. I get it. And so, yeah. so, so you don't want, for some dogs, you just don't want that available because they'll be chasing it. That's the, that's the clicker, guys. 
rationale. Exactly. Um, you know, we don't we don't want to distract them too much with a high value treat, yep. but we want them to know exactly when they did it. Right. Same philosophy. Yeah. So we give that marker word. Um, the dog looks at us. Yes. We present the reinforcer, and then what we do is try to elongate it. Yeah. And get it yeah. longer and longer. Um, our rewards. It's important to talk about rewards. Our rewards have to be worth working for. Yeah. So a lot of times we only use certain treats for certain behaviors. Yeah. Some of our toughest treats will be the most powerful reinforcers. And the other part of it is we're not treat dependent. We do variable rewards. Okay. So so sometimes it's a treat, sometimes it's praise. Yeah. Sometimes it's nothing. It's intermittent. It's yeah. a variable reward system. So the dog will actually work harder not knowing what it's going to get. You know, oh, that's fascinating. So literally and figuratively, they're on their toes all the time. You got to keep them on their toes. You got <laughs> to yeah. keep. You got to keep their training exciting because we yeah. we can bore them, you know, and then we lose behavior. Why are you the- looking at me when you say boring? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I get it. And and these are all so fundamental. If your mom was a kindergarten teacher for thirty two years, I get it. I never learned it enough to to apply to dogs, but it's absolutely true. So let's go through the repertoire. Missy, if, if we're going to train dogs over the course of, a well, a dog's lifetime, um, the rewards are all the things that Jason mentioned. Uh, what about other kinds of positive reinforcements? Praise. Keep Lots going. Of praise. Keep going. Touch. Yeah, I mean, all different forms of praise, right? Yeah, okay, good, all right. Good dog, good boy. Yes, the markers yeah. and the food. I mean, that's yeah. You know, what I, I use. Yeah, I hunt in the desert. Instead of food, sometimes it's water. Oh, yes, yep, I've seen some handlers do that. And, yeah. and then the other one, and I don't know quite how to, how to uh, translate this, but sometimes... What a dog wants to do is go back to hunting. Mm-hmm. So a quick release from whatever they're doing mm-hmm. might be an idea. Jason, he couldn't wait. He yeah. stole, stole the microphone back sorry, from Sorry, sorry. He's having a hard time with us. But. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know where we're going here. Yeah, right. but, but I wanted to just back to praise a little bit yeah. um, and how to praise your dog and just the importance of making it worth the efforts of your puppy and you brought up touch and i think touch is one of the the least utilized thing you know we're all focused on treating um but there's all kinds of ways of reinforcing um your 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 attachment the the dog your leadership when you were hand feeding um that creates a your, your dog has pleasure when being with you um there's there's that touch you know, and you're melding it with treats. You're melding it with certain commands like good dog, yes. And so um, I can't stress enough that that, that reinforcement system that you're using um, includes the, all of his favorite toys, includes all of the food, all of your, your relationship with the dog, and you're putting it to words so that you're developing this really rich relationship with your puppy. And it's really based on you putting in effort. Well, rewarding your dog isn't always easy. You know, it's yeah, easy to say yeah. good dog, let's go. Yeah, You know, in, yeah. In, with our older dogs, we can do that. But with puppies, it takes a little effort. It takes some, some enthusiasm to really get them to do what you need them to do. Two quick items before the break. And I, I think we got the, the microphones on the right two people for this. Uh, what are the magic food treats? And do we ever use baby talk? So who wants to take which? I use their food. I yeah. never treat with anything other than their food. Really? Yeah, how have you learned that the hard way or what? No, they want if they're working for their food, they're actively interested in what they need to get from you. Yeah, which is their food, right? Okay. They're going to do whatever they need to do to get what they want, yeah. right? Yeah, and their food. You're you're not unnecessarily giving them extra calories that they don't need. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh. Treats are not nutritionally dense they don't provide really any of anything other than empty calories so food their dog food their kibble is designed for them and they will work for it i'm 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 the bad parent yeah so (laughs) so so you've got a pocket full of chicken skin Uh, i'll I'll have cheese hot dogs liver snacks whatever whatever the dog is driven for and the and the if, if there's an area that the puppy's having difficulties in yeah and i bring out those intermittently yeah yeah i i get excitement 
Yeah. You know, I get I get a change of attitude. And just backing up one more time, one more thing about praise is um, you, or reinforcement is tone of voice. Tone of voice is super important because your dog studies you every day. It knows how you're speaking. It knows your emotions for you do. So your inflection of how you talk to your puppy and, the, and the, those high falsetto tones Thank you. are very, very reinforcing yeah. and powerful for a young pup. No, I, I can't agree more. I've watched in, in the obedience world, in the agility world, and then I hunted with a, a German VDD handler who talked to her six-year-old dog like it was a six-year-old child. And that dog would have walked on his lips for that person. She was so good at it. And I, I see it more in, in women than in men. We are just a little uncomfortable talking like this all the time. But uh, good boy, Jason. Thanks yeah. for bringing that up. Absolutely. And it's hard for men yeah. to do that. Yeah. And Blaine, Blaine, Blaine does bring He's it out agreeing, in them. Yeah. yeah. And many times we've explained to handlers, you need to step it up a notch. You yeah. need to bring it up a few octaves because you want to get that desired result. Yeah. And again, I don't think you have to always do it. But I, I, I've seen so many guys walk a, a uh, a high energy Labrador trying to get him to walk at heel. Heel! Heel! And instead, remember Barbara Woodhouse? Walkies! <laughs> it worked. It really did. And on that note, yes, you had to hear it. We're going to take a quick break. We're here at the Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic in Minneapolis with the whole fam damly, the Carters from Blaine to Jason to Patty to Missy. We'll be back in just a moment. Yeah. And we will get back to Pheasant Fest and the Carter family and all those incredible insights very soon. First, let me remind you that we have the road trip feature coming up where I'll talk about uh, making your drive slightly strategic for a bunch of good reasons. So we'll talk about that. After this word from Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, they are the source for Browning shotguns. MidValleyClays.com is where you learn more about what they have in stock. And that's where you get the phone number to call Dave Fiedler to find those uh, hard to find Browning models. Uh, you know, they stock everything from the Satori to the new Maxis, and all the hard to find models are available to Dave when they're not available to a lot of other people. I know. I've talked to the guy who manages the shotgun department at Browning. He is uh, at the other end of a direct pipeline to midvalleyclays.com. If you're up for a Browning, doesn't matter which kind, they've, they've got it or they can get it at midvalleyclays.com. And time is running out, as they say. Trulockchokes.com is having a sale on their Pinhoti turkey chokes just in time for spring. 15% off all Pinhoti turkey chokes through April at trulockchokes.com. And if you don't think uh, a choke has a lot uh, to do with your shooting ability, your shooting success, take a look at some of the pattern papers and read some of the articles at trulockchokes.com. I think you will change your mind. I know I have. Welcome back to Pheasant Fest and the Quail Classic, where we are talking with all the people I never get to see anywhere else. And that's the best part about this. And this is, again, like a family reunion for us. I haven't seen you all except in passing at who knows what in the last couple of years. Uh, the whole Carter family is here. We're going to start with Blaine on this one because, Blaine, you, you, um, you've guided a bit as well and you're an avid hunter too so let's get let's get on to the you know where the rubber meets the road when we're handling dogs in the field whether we're chasing woodcock rough grouse or something else bob whites down in the south where we've been together what what are some of the things that we could do better in the field to handle our dog and get more toward the ultimate goal peak performance well you know <clears throat> If you look, I, I got to go back. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I bet I, they argue every night at dinner. Yeah. <laughs> if you think when they, when they were injecting with a young dog touch, yeah. now we're getting into equipment. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're getting into your long leads. You're getting into your e-callers in some cases. You do uh, th- that touch portion is the communicator to the learning. It, May it be yeah. a tug on the lead, how to interact, and then you, they talked about tone and where you're going. Nothing's any worse than going hunting with somebody that is just constantly hacking yeah. at that dog. And if you hunt grouse, you, you know, and they're hacking, the dog's not listening, the dog's not attentive to his hunt, it, the dog's interrupted, you're interrupted, uh, it sometimes makes a difficult hunt. Well, you know, remember the Charlie Brown cartoons where the teacher would talk? And then remember the Gary Larson cartoon where it was blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 ginger, blah, blah. There, There is a maximum number of words a dog wants to comprehend in a command, for example, or in a hunt, right? Well, of course there is. You know, there's the turn command, there's a stop command, uh, come command. uh, There's a number of commands. But you're not doing a play-by-play. No, I got a rule. Yeah? My rule is don't say anything unless you got something to say. (laughs) What a concept. I wish some of my interviewees would remember that. Oh, wait. No, that's what they tell me all the time. <laughs> yes, yeah, maybe it was a choice. <laughs> all right. So, so now, now that you've said your bit about that, back to my question, which is, what, what's the biggest mistake we make when we handle our dog in the field besides giving a, a running commentary? Not staying in the game with the dog. And this dog's out there hunting, right? I think a lot of handlers says, you got to stay with me. Well, if I had a young dog going to the field, I need to stay with him. I need to be able to see his mistakes, and I need to be getting and communicating with him when he is making his mistake. Then as they get older and more reliable, I can start relaxing because now I've set distance. Yeah. I've set, I've set communication. I've set a, a number of things where I'm able to operate him when he's most distracted as well as being able to relax and let him do his thing and then see what behavior is going to come because if you get in there and you're constantly hacking them yeah they're going to make mistakes yeah they're going to bust the bird they're going to do some things and then, and if that takes them in too deep into the desire package then shut them down there's no problem with that now come on come back here listen to me let's try this again it's that reset where the learning is. You used two words that I'm fascinated with. Did you say desire package? Yes. Talk to me. Well, a dog's got a certain dr- drive for game. I yeah. mean, he's, he wants to go out and find game. If he doesn't want to go out and find game, you're, you're sitting on a <laughs> one-way street, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's a couch potato. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so the desire, we're talking about prey drive prey, well you can call it anything you want yeah. it's a want for it's a want for what you want yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know the game is the, yeah. is what we're out there for so how do we reset is is take them away take them yeah. draw their interest to yourself yeah and then take if they're in a particular cover that is is is, is really gamey get out of it just go somewhere get control of it and then take them back into your birds like if you're woodcock if you're out here in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and you've got woodcock available to you. Those are great little birds. You mock them in. They don't always take a big flight off. They, they do a shot run. Don't take that dog at that bird right now because he's got chase in mind. Get yeah. him off that chase and get yeah. his mindset. Reset that. Reset his thinking a little bit. And put a little obedience into you. See, this is where your touch and your obedience and all this little young dog development, you know, there is. We've been dog training. I mean, I read a book. It was, I think it was published in 1890. They used the uh, uh, terminology breaking. Yeah, yeah. And they used the terminology of the whip. Or they used some, some real drastic thing. But if you look at process, we really haven't changed a lot. Yeah. And, you know, you, you bring up an interesting point. And, uh, Patty, maybe you can address this. That is um, the reset. And I, I, for years, what I've done when I drop the tailgate and allow the dog to come out, first thing we do is we heal ourselves around the truck. He understands this is 
a work day, and then maybe another couple commands. Some guys will do a, a couple of really short retrieves, just so the dog understands. I'm clocking in. It's time to go to work. Um, d- can you do that during the hunt as well? Yeah, it's just that, that quick timeout. You don't have, yeah. to have to be a long timeout. But, yeah. You know, you start off and... You know, I just look at, I started my yard work and my, my forest work around our home. Yeah. Pretty just much transfers into the cover or the wood roads we hunt on. Mm-hmm. And um, my dog not wants to know where I am. Yeah. And I've just been very blessed and, and we've, and like you guys were talking about, inherited. Well, it is inherited. This is genetics. You have dogs that could care less whether you're there or not. Yeah. And we've learned we don't like that. We want the dog to touch bases, check in, you know, uh, and they do. They come out of the cover. You're walking behind them. They check. They go back in the cover. Yeah. And um, they read, constantly are reading my body English. And, and is that because of the relationship that starts with holding the food in the hand? Uh, absolutely. And, and it just absolutely. So our job is to continue to build that uh, yeah. that invisible absolutely cord. But they have to us. want to be there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you have that cord and you have to pull it all the time, yeah, you ought to try something different. <laughs> okay. So just for the record, one yeah. more time, how do we get them to want to be that cooperative? You know, I can't even tell you. It just happens. I think it's, it's genetics. It's, so it, uh, Missy had a suggestion. Give yeah, her that yeah, signal again. Yeah. and then. Uh, uh, I believe yeah. um, every single dog I have for the last five generations coming down from the same parents yeah. have been, uh, they want to come back. I toot, yeah. toot my whistle, yeah. and it transfers to positive. Yeah. So... Breeding does help. Absolutely. Yes. It's the whole thing. But uh, but there are dogs that have great breeding that don't cooperate, and that's that's what we're trying to help is to, you know, I, I guess we'll call it enhance that idea. The temperament yeah. of the animal is everything. you got a, you and, got a inspiration. Yeah. Jason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and once, once the dog, once the bird becomes part of the process, our, our food treats are of no value to the dog. Yeah. The dog's not yeah. going to retrieve to you the bird because you have a treat in your pocket anymore. Really? It's, 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 it's passion is to find that game. So for us, you know, once, once, once we're in the woods and we're, we're after the birds, we're, we're not bringing treats with us. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So at some point uh, they've graduated. Yeah. We, yeah. We've grown past that. It's, their prey drive is up to a point where food wouldn't matter anyhow. Okay. Hold that thought, Missy, because I want to take one more tangent on that one. Sure. There are there are trainers that I know in the West who who take that to the extreme. Yeah. So the dog brings back the bird, then the dog gets the bird, and if the dog eats the bird, it's okay, especially in training. Yeah, yeah. Um, I understand that the bird is a reward. Yeah. Where do you draw the line? Where do we draw the line? So, with so he, I got it. Now I have that bird in my hand. Yeah. In my case, I've learned that I let the dog have it for a moment before yeah. I take it oh, away. Okay. I got you. Uh, but then once it's here, yeah. I'm, I'm putting it in yeah. my vest. Yeah. Yeah. Does the dog ever get it back? Right. So um, especially when, when we're developmental retrievers. Yeah. And they do. I mean, you've done your, your whole process. The dog is retrieving the hand. Everything is great. Um, a lot of times I don't take the bird. Yeah. Because w- what are we doing? We're snatching this, this, this thing that it wants the most. So it just it heals in, it sits down. I won't take it and give it back. I'll just, I'll just hang out and pet yeah. him, tell him he's a good dog, maybe heal, maybe do a sit, maybe do a couple recalls, um, maybe pl- show, when I take it out, play with it a little bit, and then put it away. And then I'm the place where it gets his reward. I'm not the person that takes it from him. You must have read my book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I learned, I probably stole that from your parents now yeah. that I think about it, but that idea just resonates so much. And I think a lot of things we do in training is we're too fast. We do everything ah. too fast. We, we, we go in, we flush that bird too fast, we ask for that recall, and then we take, we snatch it. I mean, everything, we're, we're, you know, our priorities when we're out in the field for, for us is to see the best in our dogs. We're out there for the dogs, you know, like anybody. Um, you know, if, if, you, if, you're, if, you're filling the, if you're looking to fill your bag you, with, with game, um, sometimes you lose why you're out there in the first place. And I think it's super important to know that, 
you know, that retrieve. You know, you worked hard to get that yeah. retrieve. I want to see that retrieve. I, I put agree. some blood, sweat, and tears into yeah. that, yeah. you know. And then if that's a reward for the dog, I'm not going to take it. I'm, gonna, I'm, that, I'm living in that moment. That'd you know, great. I'm holding that grouse. I'm looking at that bird. I'm seeing the dog with the bird in its mouth. That's a special moment for any upland hunter. And 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 <laughs> to hurry that <laughs> That's process. That's when you take the picture there, yes. Seth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and to hurry that process, I think does does the whole hunting experience a disservice. You know, I I I, I just want to amplify that. Sure. How many times do you get that opportunity in the course of a hunt? Why not milk it for all it's worth? Yeah. I mean, really, you're absolutely right. We're lucky enough that we have two, three, a hundred grand finales in a hunt. Absolutely. Not a hundred. If we ever had a hunt like that, it'd be kind of boring. But the idea that we're, you said we're too quick about all that stuff. Absolutely true. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I want to talk. you got to, I have, Pat, a, Patty's I have, I have got quick, to put her two I cents have, worth yeah, in. I have to. Because I, I'm into the whole part of the hunt for me. It's like, I love my dogs. And of I course. I love them watching them. Yeah. And so, you know, on point, it's like, Yep. Take a picture. Take a picture. And Terry Wilson said to me one day, Terry of Ugly Dog, he said, I suppose if you're in the grouse woods, you're going to take a picture of your dog on point. I said, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, that might be a little harder than in the pheasant field or a a quail quail So, I mean, that part is the quality of everything we've worked on so hard is that moment between the the shot, your bird, your dog goes out. Maybe he finds it. Maybe you hit it. Maybe you didn't. And And the retrieve. And a lot of times, as our dogs get older, I know mine, maybe not yours, but they'll come in. They can't wait to get rid of it yeah. because they're going out again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's so. what we were talking about, Missy, is it, it, the, the, the hunt, the resumption of the hunt being a reward in itself. I know you had another inspiration, Missy, that you wanted to bring up before Dad chimes in on something. Well, I want to ask him a question. Well, we all touched on it. Yeah. yeah. So we all touched on it. But one thing I can add is you want the dog wanting more. And the dog's <laughs> desire to work for you is they get to go, they get to do that scenario again and again yeah. and again. Yeah. And you want, and that, that creates that dog looking for where you're going, what direction you're headed in and checking in with you on a regular basis. And it creates just a much more pleasurable hunt Yeah, and they want to do it again. So always leaving them wanting more is going to create and strengthen that process. And I I will say this, there's another trainer that I've worked with a bit who uh, first off says, don't be a greedy owner when you're training. Don't wear the dog out through that that part of the uh, communication. But another one will say... um, There's a rule. Yeah? Yeah. There's rule two now. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. When do you stop? Precisely. Stop when the dog wants more. Yeah, there you go. It's just like a Broadway musical. Leave them wanting more. Um, The third most common question I get is, I'm afraid my dog might be coming gun-shy. Oh. How do I introduce a dog to gunfire? And, you know, granted, it's a long process, but what are some of the things that we should make sure we do early in the process, whether it's a puppy and it's, like many people do, banging pans together, or it's an right. a, a, a older dog and some form of a cap gun, blank pistol, whatever. Do you want to start, Missy, with the puppy side? Sure. On the puppy side, while they're in the whelping box, you might play a Western movie on TV, quite loudly while they're in the whelping box. I mean, these are just early things you can do, funny little things you can do to create some noise and exposure to different things. Having your puppies, I mean, mom and dad, the puppies are in the kitchen. They're around other barking dogs. They're around pots and pans. They're around people. The socialization is huge at an early age. But actual gunfire, you might just even have your dog in a kennel or with you in a car, and you might go somewhere where they're training and testing, or and, and there's gunfire happening in the distance as early exposure. Yeah, in the distance. And I, and I just want to make clear, we're not talking about bringing your dog to the, gu- to the gun club and walking him up to the trap line. Never. No. No. Never, never seen a good outcome from that, have you? And avoid parades and fireworks. Parades and fireworks. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm just thinking about this 4th of July where we're going to have both where I go. Blaine, uh, gunfire. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a distinct, hey, we all, no matter what kind of dog breeder you are or what kind of, you know, we all, every once in a while, and it doesn't matter. I mean, we've we've, we've seen it in our own breeding lines is, is any kind of a sensitivity to sound. Um, you said puppy is sensitive. You drop a food pan and it's too loud. Then I would I any time I see it I don't avoid it. Yeah. But I reduce it. Huh. I reduce it to the point where I can interact positively with the animal and then I can increase. Yeah. And and, and, and that will change the behavior. Yeah. So when when we're talking about reducing, I, I'll I'll suggest two ways. One is it's a, a lower volume level. Right. One way to get that is greater distance, especially if we're talking gunfire. Mm. Are, the, are there other ways? Well, I don't introduce the gunfire until uh, one of the things that I think is most important is that the want for game comes into that effect. Talk to me. It's, a, it's like anything. If you were in a whelping box and you had a shy little puppy because of something that's happened... You're going to be in there with them supporting them, not being shy of that particular one function. Yeah. Well, why would it change no matter what the age is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can, you can desensorize that sound. Yeah. I, I'll tell you a neat little trick for the dogs that have gotten into it. There's a distinct difference between sensitivity and gun shy. Yes. And we distinguish those in the, in, in the NAVDA testing system. Yes. Yeah. So, but we've had some success, the real bad ones. You know, there are, there are situations where it's not going to be corrected. Yeah. I'm sorry, the disposition of the animal is not going to happen. But we took a piece of uh, two-by-fours. Yeah, yeah. And, and put a backing on it because when I first started teaching, not being smart and being a mainer, you know, but <laughs> your fingers sometimes got in the way. So you might want to put some kind of handle on the back side of it. But what you can do is you can get the snap out of a 2 by 4 coming yeah. together yeah. that's quite similar to the gun. Mm-hmm. And when the sensitivity so around your feeding, yeah. you can go in the house and you can lightly do it. Yep. And you can intensify it. One of the things you want to do, too, for those dogs is get them heavily on game. It's when they're on game, and then that's where your distance works. Yeah. Right? One of the things we did, we start with clappers. I'll start them lightly, and then I get loud and, until I see the dog. I don't care. Then we take a gun and put it off at a distance. Right? And it, <laughs> I've, I've been, this is funny. Patty will be at the house. She'll be on the front deck. I'll call her on the phone, and I go, waiting for the dog going in on point. I got the dog on point, and I go, okay, let her go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in charge of firing yeah, the dog. I love it. Yeah, yeah, at cell phone distance. Cell phone I mean, distance. that's kind of scary, yeah. but I, I love the idea. Yeah. I got to just interject. You, know, you could do it with the two uh, because y- you showed me, but nobody can see that. Mm-hmm. Two by fours. Two two by fours yep, yep. and you clap them together yep, yep. essentially you can spend 90 cents and do that yep. or you can go like when I was a musician sitting in the back of the orchestra and the percussion section had the $300 version of the clapper uh, but I like the two by fours way better well if you think about it there was a podcast I'm not a podcast a, a, a tape that was produced. It was yeah. Beethoven fifth. Yeah. Instead of at that peak moments, they had gunshots yeah. being put yeah. in there. Yeah. Remember, and you could elevate them up and all that yeah. back in the day. You yeah, know? I love it, um, Patty. I want to take uh, one moment to talk about um, what Blaine alluded to, and that is what a lot of great trainers have figured out, and that is none of the no noise bothers a dog if they're fired up about a bird. Do you have specific ways to, I guess I'll say, combine the two? Yeah, I will, I'll have a very well socialized 
I'm talking the puppy I pick out the litter. Yeah. You know, I've presented it perfectly in the kitchen, like you talked about pots and pans, yeah. pots and pans and those clackers. Food on the floor. Just throw food on the floor. Have a uh-huh. litter of puppies uh-huh. and, and start low and build up. And they associate. When that happens, they come tear into the kitchen yeah. because it's pots and pans and clackers. Yeah. And it's food. So yeah. association. So I take my dogs outside and associate. We go. I mean, I don't even think about it because I've, I honestly, we've done so much prep work with our pups that I don't worry about that first gunshot. People ask us, like you, you say you have lots of questions about creating gun shyness or having gun shyness. I don't even think about that because I, I just have a gut feeling I know it's going to be okay. It's, it's become academic because yeah, of all I've the prep, prep work and the that's... shaping, all these things that we've done well in advance. I love it. You know, we could go on all day. We'll do this again. Uh, just like dog training, we want to leave everybody wanting more. I wish we could carry on for the rest of the day, but in the meanwhile, just a reminder... You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. We've got the Carter family, Mary meeting Kennels. We've got Blaine. We've got Jason. We've got Patty. We've got Missy. Uh, uh, two generations of incredible dog training uh, experience, knowledge, and wisdom. You put the headphones back on. Patty, you want to close us out with something? Is, no, you I just can't you, resist no, saying I'm something. No, I was just, I'm very proud. Yeah. Yeah, I and, I, and, and so am I. I'm very, yeah. I'm very glad we could finally do this. Could I just speak once? <laughs> what a dumb <laughs> question! Of course you can, Blaine. Is uh, they say the best teacher is uh, a teacher that uh, the student teaches him something. I have a family of it. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely true. I love it. We'll do this again. Carter family, Merry Meeting Kennels. Great job. Thank you very much for joining us. We're here at Pheasant Fest closing out the last day. It's been a heck of a show. And part of it is because I get to talk to people like this. Thanks so much for being part of the Upland Nation podcast. In just a moment, we'll talk about how you should plan your public access driving strategy. But first, a word from PointerShotguns.com. You know, those side-by-sides were doing so well on their own. And they've still got plenty, so find a nearby retailer at PointerShotguns.com. And then all of a sudden, out comes the case-colored receivers. Those are a little bit harder to keep in stock, but if anybody can do it, it's the guys at PointerShotguns.com. So if you're looking to upgrade... Whether it's a side-by-side or an over and under, case coloring is available on all the models you see at PointerShotguns.com. Find a nearby retailer, shop the models, take a look at some of my videos and articles they have up there, and um, then good luck with your new shotgun, whether it's for you or for somebody else, or whether it's an upgrade or just a swap from you know vertical to horizontal on the barrel shape. It's all available right there at PointerShotguns.com. And take good care of those new shotguns at SageAndBreaker.com. They've got everything you need for gun cleaning and care, from uh, cleaning mats to tools to uh, lubricants of various sorts. Sometimes you need a grease, sometimes you need an oil. It's all right there at SageAndBreaker.com. Don't miss out on future sales, and if you're interested in one of those range bags, brand new and, well, apparently very popular, sign up at SageAndBreaker.com for the mailing list, and they will let you know about when those new range bags are coming in and any other new products that are coming on board. It's all at SageAndBreaker.com. Well, like you, I'd rather hunt than drive. That and uh, being in politics in another life have led me to um, a philosophy, if you will. Hope for the best and plan for the worst. And every day that you're hunting, you have the same opportunity. My days have an itinerary. I'll take a look at that hunt atlas and save myself a little bit of grief and a lot of time and this day and age at five bucks a gallon for diesel fuel a few dollars as well i'll find that 
spot on the hunting atlas where several public access properties are fairly close together. And that's what I'll do for that day. I'll head out there uh, first thing in the morning. And in fact, I'll often go as far as I can on that itinerary and start at the farthest end, then work my way back. But the logic here is pretty indisputable. If one place doesn't work out, whether it's because there's already somebody there, it's flooded, it's been overgrazed, it got hayed before um, the, the contracts were done, whatever, you are confident you have another spot to go to and you're not making decisions at the spur of the moment. Yeah, put them in a clump or in a logical line from the farthest towards town or towards to wherever you're camping and you will have a little bit more confidence in your you know day your hunting abilities it all falls into one that's one of the tips you'll find at my webinar go to findbirdhuntingspots.com the pop-up will direct you to the webinar take a look hope you'll join me there thanks to everybody who's listening sure appreciate that thank you to the carter family blaine patty jason and missy for all of your insights and wisdom if you've commented at the social platforms or you took the survey at my weekly newsletter i sure appreciate that nice to hear from you and hear what you're thinking about do me a favor and leave a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts that's how we grow around here and we are growing at the rate of about 14 percent every couple weeks thank you And thank you to all of our sponsors. You know, they're the ones who make this all possible. I'd love to do it for free, but ain't going to happen. So with the support of these great sponsors, the Upland Nation podcast comes to you free of charge. Those folks are Sage and Breaker, Pointer Shotguns, Joy Dog Food, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, True Lock Chokes, And I hope to see you at findbirdhuntingspots.com for the webinar. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening to the Upland Nation podcast.